There are six of us, three Danes and three Swedes, who relish a canoe trip with challenges, excitement, and the sweet taste of the outdoors. Ironically, we call ourselves the Gunnels. Especially when you're shooting rapids and about to capsize, it's a question of keeping your hands on the paddle and only the paddle. Your body and your paddle are what supports and stabilizes the canoe in troubled waters. A mistake that beginners and sometimes even experienced canoers make, a pure reflex reaction, is to grab for the gunnels when the boat starts to tip. It's called gunnel grabbing. Follow your instinct to do this and you can be sure of two things. Your canoe will turn bottoms up and your buddies will break your neck. We six have done a lot of paddling in Scandinavia. Four of us have also canoed in Alaska and Canada. For the last four or five years, we paddled together. And for two years, we have thought, talked, and planned our dream trip. 600 kilometers, 370 miles across Scandinavia, from the Norwegian Sea to the Gulf of Bothnia by canoe. We're traveling from the Atlantic to the top of the Baltic. The route will take us over mountains, lakes, and waterways to the Gulf of Bothnia, across some of the last wilderness, and down one of the last unspoiled rivers in Europe. For such a journey, no vessel beats the canoe. On the Atlantic coast of Norway, 220 kilometers or 137 miles north of the polar circle lies Narvik, surrounded by mountains. We're in the land of the midnight sun. Narvik, population 20,000, is known as a port of departure for Swedish iron ore. It's Friday, June 28th. The sun hovers above day and night. We're starting our journey across from the freight harbor. The first leg is a 35 kilometer stretch of salt water into the mouth of the Skjomfjord. Here, the first big challenge awaits, a portage from the fjord up a steep mountainside to a lake some 750 meters above sea level. It's a six kilometer, 3.7 mile trek up to the lake, and each man has to do it, gear and all, at least twice. Our little expedition numbers three canoes, one Swedish, one Danish, and a hybrid Swedane. In the Swedish canoe, Per sits up front. Per is a 21-year-old student from Gothenburg. Behind him sits Friedrich, who's 23, and an electrician from Mariestad. In the Danish canoe, Anna sits in the bow. He's from Verlöser, 33 years old, and a school teacher. Af sits Klaus, 36, an electromechanic and shop foreman from Frederiksund. Finally, in the crossbreed canoe, the front paddler, Mikael, is a 35-year-old carpenter from Copenhagen. The back paddler is Johan, 30, a data engineer from Stockholm. Sunny skies, short pants, and quiet water make it a pure delight to shove off. This is how a canoe trip looks in tourist brochures. Boots and all the warm clothes in our watertight barrels today are just so much extra baggage. 
we draw closer to the big portage up the mountain and wonder how in God's world we're going to get ourselves and our gear up from this side. Johan is the biggest doubter, with reason. He was up here last year, and he noted what a long, hard slog this would be from fjord to summit. The mountains here are incredibly high and majestic. They rise more than a thousand meters from the ocean surface, really huge and impressive. You can see the frost glacier from the fjord. Its highest peak is 1,744 meters, 5,720 feet above sea level. Yesterday, when we paddled into the mouth of the Skim fjord and pulled the canoes ashore, we got a good look at the challenge we're facing. Johan was right. From a distance, the mountainside looks like a wall, even there where we're supposed to hike with all our cargo. The canoes each weigh 40 kilos, 88 pounds. We lash two paddles inside each for a better handhold and easier transport. In late June, there's still a lot of snow up there. Torrents of ice water plunge down toward the fjord. Our barrels each weigh 30 to 40 kilos. They're reinforced with a homemade shoulder strap system. Each man weighs 120 to 130 kilos, counting the burden. So we only dare walk one at a time across this bridge. With canoes on our necks, the stiff wind forces us to tread very, very carefully. We have to carry everything in two stages. First, we lug half the cargo, one half to a full kilometer up the mountain. We take it easy going back after the other half. This we tote a half to a whole kilometer beyond the spot where we left the first half of the cargo. Then on we go, leapfrog style. Our goal is Lake Midagsvan, 750 meters above sea level. That elevation means six kilometers of tough hiking. But since we're able to carry only half the cargo at a time, the result is that we each hike 18 kilometers. A total of six kilometers with the first load, plus six back after the rest, plus another six with that on our shoulders. Every man load weighs at least 40 kilos. Jag tycker faktiskt att jag menar, måttet måste ju vara att mellan två kärser så måste det vara rimligt långt att gå med den tyngsta packningen. Ja. Så det tycker jag åt helvete för långt det här. Alltså. Ja, ja. Jag tycker det är jobbigt att ta upp och ner packningen. Mm. Så jag går heller, vad ska man säga, ja, ja. lite längre sträck. Jag håller med mycket, men när man får upp grejerna så går man och då känns det rätt bra. Då är det rätt svårt att säga hur långt det är. För jag menar, varje steg så att säga, är ju jobbigt va? Ja. Vad var ditt förslag? Det var så att man liksom... Ja. Man hade tre, tre sträckor va? Eller man hade liksom tre catcher va? Man tog liksom en lätt tunna ifrån första och gick förbi andra till tredje va? Men sen, tung, sen tog, gick man tillbaka och hämtade måttunna gick man till första. Gick man ner och hämtade sin tredje tunna och så gick man upp när han dit så gick man och hämtade måttunna. Och så flyttar man upp så här bara. Med jämn och mellanom, där har vi det hela samlet på ett sted. Ja, okay. Det är tunga lastet ska man gå först. Ja. Tunga lastet. Kanot och måttunna först. Sen de som orkar gå långt med grejen kan göra det, men de andra kan sätta ner dem och så kan de gå ner och hämta en lätt tunna, egen tunna eller vad de vill och så gå upp med det.
The uphill portage is harder than expected, so we're forced to take extra breaks. And some stretches are so steep we can't make it in two trips. We have to make three. This is very tough on the knees, both up and down the steep inclines. Knowing this, we started a half year ago on a home training program. Anders and his girlfriend, who is a physiotherapist, set up an exercise program with two aims, to improve our general physical condition and to strengthen those muscles involved in hard lifting and hiking. We take a lunch break at the tree line and take some comfort in the fact that, judging from the map, we have put the steepest stretch of the journey behind us. But we still only covered half the distance. Now we're 450 meters above the sea. It's beautiful here with lots of fresh cold water. The higher we go, the shorter and more bent the birch trees grow. We can feel our shoulders got too much sun yesterday and our feet and knees are aching too. You think all the time, wow, we've reached the top and always there's one more peak to cross. We started the day yesterday at 10 a.m. with a portage down by the fjord in sunny summer weather. It was one o'clock in the morning before we could, after 14 hours of hard slogging, pitch camp here on the snow. Our two storm stoves burn kerosene. They're effective, easy to regulate, and turned all the way up, they soon have a pot bubbling. The paddles, stuck a half meter into the snow, double nicely as tent poles. Mikhail's suggestion tonight to pitch the tent on the snow wasn't popular with everybody, but the snow provides an even floor, and we have a view over Lake Midagsvan, one of the next trials on this trip. Up goes the tent. Everybody sleeps like bears in a den. We are 750 meters, 2,460 feet above the sea. Snow is a great back saver on portages. Instead of lugging everything, we can use the canoes as sledges. This eases the burden and lets us carry everything at once. The only thing that keeps us from canoeing down this mountain is the fear of ramming into boulders. Plus, of course, not knowing whether the ice on the lake is thick enough to hold us.
If the ice on Midagsvan can bear us and our heavily laden canoes, we can hike the three kilometers across the lake to the next lake, Kjordavan, and there, hopefully, we can paddle a little again before making another three kilometer portage to get to a bigger lake, Sirasjora. Hopefully, that won't be frozen over. Before we reach Sirasjora in Lapland, we'll be crossing the border between Norway and Sweden. At the far end of Lake Midaisvan, the water is open. What a wonderful feeling to get the canoes into fresh water for the first time on this trip. Pierre and Frederick dare take this sled ride, despite the risk of sailing under ice water. We've all gone sledding on snow, but the rest of us probably would have passed up this particular sled ride if Pear and Friedrich hadn't shown it could be done. Where the little waterfall empties into Lake Sirisjora, we're supposed to meet Finn Erik from Narvik. This meeting was prearranged. Finn Erik teaches a course in nature and the environment, and he's a veteran canoeist and outdoorsman. As a young man 35 years ago, Finn Erik and five friends took a canoe trip not unlike ours. They also started on the Atlantic coast of Norway and went inland across the mountains, down through Toysa Valley, over toward Kaidem River. Their destination was the town of Kaidem and the railroad, a journey full of man traps. Two of the men in one of their three homemade canoes had to give up after seven days when they reached the Swedish Tourist Association summer campground at Riesen. Det var bekant av studenter. I det här tillfället så var det en åtta tio kvinnliga studenter från Stockholms trakt med som var där och vi blev ju där lite extra länge. Men vi måste ju till slut fortsätta och då visste sig att vi klart inte att få reparerat den tredje kanon så att var bara två kanon så fortsatte och kom man fortsatte till fots över sita som är till sjön. Vi som uh, drog vidare, vi kom då ut i en ganska vild eld som vi dock ska starta på nu. Uh, ner mot uh, från utajöra. Och där har vi rört uh, vi först med vår kamer. Vi klarade då berge kamen och utstyret som någon lunda. Var det samtidigt har vi rört? Nej, den har vi rört då uh, antagligen kvällen efter. Vi först har vi rört vi nästan med klart och berge kamen. Och så kom då de efter och det fick ju inte vi vite för vi mötte dem i Narvik att de hade då gått igenom ett skickligt stryk och kanon och allt utstyr var knust. Det var väl så vitt egentligen bara livet. Räddningsvästar det var inte uppfunnet den gången som bruk som man har nu idag. Det, men det vill säga si, i padlade ikke sammen. Alltså den ene kanon lå föran den andra. 
Ja, og vi skulle vente dem. Skulle vi vente et visst eh, til neste dag. Hvis ikke de var kommet der, så regner vi med at de hadde snudd og dratt tilbake. Det må være bedre på det er to kanoer. Hvis der sker noget, så kan man hjælpe hinanden. Jo, men det er så pass vildt den elva. Jeg vil også se, at det er lidt vanskeligt at holde kontakt da. Nogen må næsten dra for det. Og hvis du først havner ud for et stryk, så er det ikke bare at komme sig tilbage igen, for terrænet var veldig vildt og vanskeligt. Men i alle fall, vi visste ikke om dem. Vi så bare at de kom ikke, og vi måtte bare dra videre. Vi visste at de måtte gå til fots næsten 100 km til, til Norge. Med minimalt med utstyr. Vi visste om at alt vi hadde av utstyr. All six survived, but only one canoe, Finn Eriks and his buddies, managed to reach their goal, the railway line across the Kaidem River. Our home sewn tent passed the weather test last night. We pitched it on a huge flat rock yesterday and secured it, lucky for us, with so much extra string and rope it looked like a great spider in its web. During the night, it started to rain and blow so hard we thought the tent was going to take off or be shredded. We went out a couple of times to check the lines. Everything held, and our only souvenir was damp sleeping bag ends caused by water pressed through the seams by the storm. There is more ice than we'd expected and hoped to see here on beautiful Lake Cedars Yarda. In fact, it looks as if it's completely frozen over. Because of the weather last night and this morning, we don't get started today until 2 p.m., Fortunately, after fighting across soft and crusty ice for an hour, we do arrive at open water. Now it's midnight, and after 30 kilometers of paddling in the beams of the midnight sun, we reach Sitas Dam and the lap town of Sitas. In 1980, the mighty torrent at the mouth of Lake Sitas Yora was cut off. A dam was built across the river, and a long tunnel bored under the mountain to channel the water down to the hydroelectric station at Ritsim. Most of the year, Sitas Yora Stogana is a ghost town, but in September, the laps butcher caribou all over the district. And here in June and July, the calves have to be branded. So at this time of year, 50 or so people live here. How long do they stay there? I don't know how long they stay so long. They stay so long, they stay so long, they stay so cold. They stay so cold. Yeah, yeah. They stay so cold. 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 Det måste ha varit ett hårt liv att bo året om i en båt. Det har varit ett hårt liv, men frisk. Ja, det är friska var de. Aldrig på ut. In earlier times, the laps used dogs to round up their reindeer. Those times are over. Now they do it by motorcycle and helicopter. The calves are born in mid-May and are now a month and a half old. They stick close to their mother's side. All the animals have identifying clips in their ears. That's how the lap herders find out which newborn calves belong to whom and make sure the calves all get the right snip in one ear. Och 
Var det en kraftig el för sig? Ja, det här var en kraftig el. Det var, alltid var det hög vatten på förr och vid sommar. Ja, det är lite vatten nu. Det går nog dåligt att paddla, men det finns ju skälar där. Förut var det en stor el som rann ner härifrån. Men de byggde en tunnel och födde vatten över till Ritz. Men, men ska de inte släppa lite vatten? Ja, de släpper inte annars än när det blir så att det, vattnet går över. De har byggt dammen precis. Att när det magasinet blir fyllt, det som blir över, det rinner över dammen. Men sen blir det från allt det här och neråt. Där har det gått en gång. Jag går då och paddlar med kanon. Oh. Fast det är forsfrikt. Det är många forsar? Ja, oh, det är många forsar. Ja, det är nästan fors så hela väg. Ja, det finns ju två sjöar där i Mellan. Uh-huh. Men du tror det är fossa man kan, man kan paddla med kanot? <laughs> ja, det om man ska ha haft en sån där gummibåt. Då. <laughs> Hur är det med fisken här? Ja, nu är det mer dåligt med fisk. Man får ju matfisk och man lägger ut många nät. När de byggde dammen, vattenfall, var, var, det ingen, var, det ingen som, var det ingen protest mot dammen? Jo, det var ju, vi försökte protestera men det gick. Det går ju inte att protestera när det gäller så det större företag. De bygger ändå. Ja. Fast vi har ju fått lite ersättning för det, för förlorat mark. Ofta när man kommer på sådana ställen ja. där fallen är tålagda så, så önskar man att man kunde, kunde riva dammen och få se hur det, hur det verkligen ser ut. <laughs> ja. Men när man har varit här tidigare så... Så vi saknar man det där bruset i forsen. Ja, i forsen. Ja. Det, är, det är en stor förändring, det är det. Ja. Måste vara det varit vilt fort oh, där? Jo, jo, det var det väldigt. Inte tror jag man hade släppt med kanot. Nej, 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 det syns inte. <laughs> <laughs> ja, det är jävla. <laughs> nej, jag tror inte jag heller den var gå. <laughs> måste kunna smaka lite grann med råka. Tack, 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 tack. Nå! Åh! Oh! Skål! Skål. Ja, det ser bra och trevlig sommar. Tack, det samma. Vi får nu här, här efter ner då. Ja, vi får ju lyfta ner hela här nere. Ja, inte det är från allt det första forsen får man bara släppa. <laughs> ja, inte är det nog farligt. Man hör. Men, men, men längre neråt, där, där finns det ju. Men inte är det så stora forsen. We've been underway now for seven days, one third of the time we planned for the whole trip. We've covered roughly 75 kilometers, 46 and a half miles of this 600 kilometer or 370 mile journey across Scandinavia. So far, about a fifth of the trip has been over land. The next leg is the one we know least and are most nervous about. After Lake Aurejorda, we'll follow the stream through Toysa Valley. Studying our map, we don't understand why the laps have told us there are no waterfalls in Toysa Valley. One thing is certain, the river has great drops, and that means a wild and tricky stream. So we're a bit uptight about this next leg of the journey. Mm-hmm.